Hi, folks, it's Denise Howell, and next up on Triangulation, I'm joined by author, consultant, and speaker, Kate O'Neill. Her book is Tech Humanist, and I'm sure at the end of our interview, you'll agree with me that we should clone her and put her at the elbow of every upper management tech company executive and every lawmaker involved in making tech policy. She's bullish on tech's potential to help humanity, but well aware of the pitfalls and dangers. Join us. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 392, recorded March 15th, 2019. Kate O'Neill, Tech Humanist. Hi folks, I'm Denise Howell and you're joining us today for Triangulation. I'm so excited to be here today with Kate O'Neill who is known as and has authored a book called Tech Humanist. She is helping humanity prepare for an increasingly tech-driven future by teaching businesses how to make technology that's better for humans. And lately, you've done a lot more talking with humans about how their data is being used by businesses as well. So uh, you're you're getting lots of discussion on both sides of that problem. Yeah, it's, thanks for having me too, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's true. It's been um, exploding and expanding in, in all kinds of different ways. I think initially I thought that the way to ensure that humans have the best experiences into the future, into this tech-driven future, is by talking with uh, corporate leaders, business leaders, uh, who are by and large driving the majority of the tech innovation and who are also um indirectly or directly creating the experiences mostly that humans are having. So by influencing their thinking and by helping them align their business strategy with human outcomes and with meaningful human experiences, that we could have the best results from that. But I'm finding that there's also this discussion about technological literacy with mainstream people. Uh, And there's also a discussion with governments and with um, entities that sort of interface with governments about ethics and responsibility and and what level of regulation is appropriate and what types of regulation and and this sort of thing. So there's this kind of uh, these multiple nodes that are expanding out from the original idea and the original thesis. Uh, And that's very exciting. It's, It's been an interesting time. Yeah, I bet it has. And your career just sounds so interesting uh, right out of the gate that that we should discuss, I think, a little bit about how you get to do what you do, you know, how you got to be <laughs> in this place. Um, so tell us a bit about your background and your career path. Sure. It's, it has admittedly been uh, a, a little twisty and turny <laughs> at times, uh, but it's been 20 plus years in technology in various forms, uh, starting out when the, when the web really first came about. Uh, I built a website um, that was that was for the the language laboratory at the University of Illinois at Chicago, which I was supervising, uh, and it turned out to have been either the first or one of the first departmental websites at the university. And that the fact of its rarity got it noticed uh, by a couple of people. It was at the time when when websites could be listed manually or curated manually on lists of like what's new and what's cool. I don't know if you remember those those heady years of the web. Uh, but that got uh, some traction with a, a, a couple of people around the world, and one of them was a guy at Toshiba in San Jose, and ended up recruiting me out to uh, to build an intranet for Toshiba, which was the first intranet for Toshiba. So I didn't really know how to do that, but nobody else did either, so I sort of figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really the, uh, sort of the pattern of my early tech years and my early career is just uh, having enough curiosity and enough, um, you know, sort of drive to to solve problems that just existed that people had identified or I had identified and figure out the technology to do that. Uh, so one thing after another, I, I ended up the first content manager at Netflix, uh, and that was a, a fun time to be there in 99, 2000, 2001 sort of time frame. Uh, they had just sunset their a la carte rental online program and and sort of went double down on, um, on the subscription program for DVTs, which obviously was uh, the key to their, their success. And what I loved about being at Netflix in that time 
was they're still in all out bloody battle with Blockbuster. Uh, but yet Reed Hastings is already investing R&D dollars into what we're terming set top boxes, but that's the predecessor to streaming as we know it today. So that's 2000 and it's six years before Roku comes out and seven years before they have a, a streaming only plan uh, available on Netflix. So the the foresight there is just astonishing to me. And it, it, it regularly humbles me to think of the people that I've been able to be around and, and learn from uh, uh, who have just been able to be so smart and visionary and strategic about the way they see these things unfolding. Uh, so uh, that, and then fast forward a number of years, I uh, start an agency called MetaMarketer and uh, doing data-driven analytics and strategy services for companies, including Adobe, Symantec, uh, the Grand Ole Opry, lots of really fun clients. Uh, and that was a, a great time to, to be sort of coalescing a lot of these thoughts around how uh, experience was really the key to unlocking uh, the, the, the link between business interest and human interests. Uh, so companies needed to think about the customer experience, the user experience, because it needed to be able to seamlessly convey what the value of the company and its brand and its offering was. And people on the other side of that transaction needed to be able to have uh, as meaningful ex an experience with them as possible. So that it would be memorable, so that it would be uh, frictionless, so that it would bring them as close to the ideal of the state uh, of, of being in the role that they were in at the time as customer or as user or as guest or patient or student or whatever role they might be in. And uh, later that turns into, I, I realized that that's really a limited view and it's it's really humanity that we're talking about there, human experiences. So it's uh, it, it all comes through uh, this kind of progression over 20 plus years in this space uh, and, and just observing and working around uh, the, the, the emerging technologies and how they play out for people and how we use them to communicate with each other, how we use them to connect and be fuller, richer <laughs> versions of ourselves and connect with people in, in deeper and more meaningful ways. That's fantastic. And, and I think we'll really go a long way toward setting the stage for what we're going to talk about here today. Um, so I'm curious in the experiences you just encapsulated for us, um, how you personally decided to take this humanist approach. Where I'm wondering if you were confronted as you were having your 20 years of work experience with these various companies, um, if you were confronted with situations that that jarred with you um, cognitively, where you uh, looked at something and said, wait, that's not going to be good for our customers or our users, or they're not going to like it. And then you began to be the internal voice about making sure your company didn't go down that path. Yeah, I think it. I think there were fewer instances of uh, the sort of cautionary tale and more just an evolving understanding that um, that the the interface with the people outside the company was crucially important to the success of the company and to the fulfillment of those people outside the company. So there was there there was an already there was already present an alignment between those objectives. It just needed to be kind of brought out and reinforced. And so even from my earliest years in my career, uh, doing the work of, of building an intranet, it was all about the constituencies that that served, uh, who was going to be able to access what they needed to access, thinking about what need they might have, how would they be able to find a document that they needed at any given time, and just consistently putting myself in the, in the position of advocating for the user, or advocating for the person who was trying to accomplish a given thing at any given moment. And that just carries through my career. I, I find myself the user advocate, I find myself the customer advocate, and uh, eventually I realized that what I'm really doing is advocating for humanity in all of its, in all of its interactions with technology and with business. And that, it, that more and that's more a really often that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that's such a crucial and and unique insight, and I think that um, you know it's not it's not one that uh, a lot of people as they're going about their day to day business lives necessarily have. So it's a good thing that you <laughs> did, um, and that uh, you're out there writing and advocating for those kinds of concerns. Um, what I wrote down a couple of notes to myself in in thinking about talking with you today, and one was that. 
what you do and the advice that you give and the counseling that you give to your clients and governments and uh, various forums in which you speak on these issues um, is, is this notion of our ability to predict the future and our ability to accurately predict the future. Um, that it's so crucial to what you do, and yet it's so hard to do. Uh, because yeah. we in the technology industry love to think about the future. We love to dream about the future. We love to uh, watch and read science fiction about the future. But when it comes right down to it, none of us are very good about predicting where things are going to go. And um, there have been a couple of examples of that that you've mentioned already here today. Uh, the way that at the beginning of the web, uh, people would index the web and curate the web. And that looked like the way we were all going to experience it. And then it shifted so radically away from that. Um, yeah. Although indexing and curation still definitely have their roles. And then, of course, you know, the business model at Netflix that you mentioned that switched from the physical delivery of a media device to, um, the Netflix that we know today, the juggernaut yeah. that it is. So I guess my question based on that observation is, is how do you position uh, future predicting within your role as a counselor on these issues? Um, do you kick yourself when you're not accurate? Do, 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 how do you try and make yourself more accurate? Because Getting it right winds up mattering quite a bit. Sure. And I think the key for me is that I, I never have tried to position myself uh, first and foremost as a futurist. I think uh, that, that's sort of a secondary or even tertiary function of, of the work that I do. What I'm trying to do more often is uh, is do true true strategy and help companies think about the way that what they're offering, it, how, how the essence of what they're offering can be delivered and experienced by people. Uh, so the more people, the more companies can get in touch with the, the core of what they're trying to accomplish. And, and, and in Tech Humanist, I, I drill into that and talk about purpose. And purpose is, is uh, you know, a bandied about term that so often gets taken into, uh, into areas that don't necessarily pertain to business strategy. But I think it's still a useful word and a useful construct here because really what it's it's getting at is this kind of driving force and what what the company is actually in business to do and what they're trying to accomplish at scale and when they when you can get to that whether you're talking about the the indexing of the web i mean that's really about making sure that um what's out there can be found so if you're doing that manually at first eventually you know the question becomes how do we make this happen at scale more more effectively and maybe indexing with a robot and being able to serve that up through a search engine kind of format as google eventually did and of course plenty of, of search engines did before google but google sort of you know most most effectively delivered that experience for people so i think that's really the core and crux of it for me is is you, as long as you're thinking about purpose or strategy or strategic purpose, if you kind of combine the ideas, and as long as you're thinking about human experience, if you can ground the ground uh, ground the <laughs> the thinking in purpose and in humanity, you're going to be an awful lot closer to being able to deliver on something that is truly useful and meaningful to people, even if it is off in a given direction, you know, sort of an, a degree or two from where the future trend ends up going you're still going to have yourself in the right direction. So I think that's always the the orienting way for for companies to think about the future is it's not it's not so mysterious. We're always going to have to think about how this serves humans and what the relationship is between and when I say humans I'm actually talking about humans inside and outside the company. So you have to think about culture and how employees are engaged with the company as well. So purpose is a really great tool there as well, because being able to understand what a company really exists to do and is trying to do at scale, that's something that employees can really engage with and really feel kind of part of and, and like they serve some, uh, some idea that's bigger than themselves and can engage really fully. So I always use the example of Disney theme parks and I, I love the simplicity of that articulation of strategic purpose where they can say that what they exist to do at scale is create magical experiences. 
And I think that's just so simple and clear because you can imagine anyone in the organization from an executive all the way through sort of a, a sort of customer support person to a designer of an experience to an, a janitor to someone working at a retail counter, every single one of them, if they're if it's true, if they're given the authority and the the um, the ability to make decisions commensurate with their scope of their job function, then they can truly make decisions as as they come as problems come their way on behalf of the the human, the guest and say, you know, what's going to create the most magical experiences for people. So I think as long as there's that articulation and as long as you're thinking about what what really is going to resonate with people and how you're going to bring those those offerings and the value proposition to the human experience. I think just keeping abreast of technology changes and trying to understand how those are playing out in in the space, that's it really doesn't have to be that much more complicated than that. I think a lot of times uh, business leaders are looking for, you know, kind of a roadmap of what's going to be next year's big hit technology wise or, you know, five years from now, what should we, we invest in for the five to 10 year horizon? And that's all just too subject to change. I think you have to be willing to uh, to to take some some risks around pieces of technology, but those pieces of technology have to be in service of the purpose and of the human experience, or else you're just throwing you know money into one technology after another. Okay, uh, we will have a good example in a moment for how it might be hard to parse what what having uh, a magical experience is in every instance um or yeah. or what you know to translate over to what we're talking about in in technology companies uh what serving human interests winds up being um but the second note that i wrote down to myself uh just sort of to frame our discussion is that you must um deal frequently with the difference between must and should in in helping companies choose a path. Um, there's certainly, uh, as you just put it, there's an overarching vision that the company might want to attain, but there, you know, the devil's in the details as to how you get there and there are choices to be made along the way. And I'm just wondering um, how you think about that distinction, um, that there's a framework of laws and regulations that provide the the must part. Um, and in the area we're talking about, they may not be as fully fleshed out as they're likely to get in the next several years. And then of course, there's the should aspect that goes past what the law might require and really goes to everything you've been discussing. You know, what are what are the values that um, are gonna serve a humanistic interest here and serve our customers and really humanity as a whole. So, so do you make that distinction, or do you always hew to the the should over the must? Well, I think the further apart those get, and that you allow them to get as a leader, the more uh, obviously the more friction you're going to experience. So, I think that the the operating um, bias should be to to try to hew those as close together as possible. If if you know that you're going to run up against, uh, say, data collection restrictions, that that's going to be an emerging uh, an emerging area of concern for for people and governments, then it makes complete sense to think about running your company in such a way that you are collecting the data that is useful and meaningful to your business to serve your business purpose and to fulfill the human objectives of the, those who interact with you. The, the closer you can bring the, the must and should together, I think it just makes sense that, that you're going to be in, in less of a, a divided position and you're going to find yourself making fewer and fewer choices that, that are you know, questionable and that lead you to to the risk of of bad PR and um, and violations of data ethics and breaches and leaks and and all of the other things that go wrong with with that emerging territory. Okay, let's let's talk about some specifics. Uh, you were on our network back in January 
Uh, we should remind people that back in January, this thing happened that was called the 10 year challenge. It's already March and people may have forgotten. Mm -hmm. So um, can you fill people in who either didn't experience it at the time or you know, the passage of time has just chased it from their memories? Yeah, you know, a day in internet time is a really mm -hmm. long time. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, the the ten year challenge, of course, uh, folks may remember, was a hashtag and a part of a an overall trend that people were sharing either their ten year old photo or a first photo that they used as a profile picture alongside a current one, and it evolved into the the we think it was um how hard has aging hit you was one of the hashtags that people were were using uh, to describe this campaign. So organically, I think it started to to skew toward this 10 year challenge hashtag. Uh, and eventually I, I tweeted a comment that, uh, you know, 10 years ago, me probably would have participated in this meme. And the current me is just thinking about how all of this data could be used to train a facial recognition algorithm on age progression. And that tweet started to gain a lot of traction. I think you know the the sort of controversial nature of it, or the um, the conspiracy theory nature of it, started to <laughs> <laughs> generate a lot of interest, and it got retweeted a lot. Uh, I ended up uh, being approached by Wired to to elaborate that. Uh, oh, actually, before that, I had actually built out a, a tweet a Twitter thread about you know sort of playing out the thought experiment. You know, okay, well, it's not. I'm not saying this is what's happening, but if it were. Uh, here's mm -hmm. how it could actually be feasible. Um, you know, and why would it matter? People are saying those photos are already out there. So why should it matter if you're resharing them? And so I elaborated on the points that, uh, you know, basically this is an, a, a group of people out there saying, here are two perfectly curated photos. I'm now telling you with the, the, this selection of these photos that these are 10 years apart or at least in theory, they're 10 years apart. Perhaps people are fudging a little bit, but that's the idea. And so now, yeah. you know, uh, that that people are kind of going, yeah, but you know, you, they, you could gather those photos from profile pictures and the dates are already time stamped on there. And But for a ver variety of reasons, that isn't necessarily true. That data may have been scraped off at various points. So I go through all of this and then I write that up in an op-ed for Wired and then that, article takes off. <laughs> so uh, it ends up that, uh, you know, I ended up having this conversation about facial recognition and privacy and, um, and, and sort of data, personal data responsibility on a variety of, of news channels. This, this channel, thank you, uh, as yes. well as, you know, BBC News and um, uh, uh, just a, a number, NBC, NPR Weekend Edition and uh, a lot of other channels. So it was it was fantastic and interesting to kind of get the feel of how do I translate what just happened in terms of a moment in social media culture into uh, something that we can talk about that's really graspable and important for people to think about on an ongoing basis. And it doesn't matter whether there was any nefarious intent behind the meme. It's more to the point that it's the pattern that it fits the pattern of a meme that could be used to collect this kind of data. And we saw that happen with the Cambridge Analytica collection of data uh, through a game that people willingly played and gave up an awful lot of information that could be you know, sort of matched and, and uh, targeted for, um, for, as it turned out, manipulation of a presidential campaign, among other things. So now, uh, you know, we, we have, I feel like there's there's been a few of these opportunities to raise this discourse and and start talking with people you know more more often about what happens when we share our data online what what are the possible ramifications what are we giving up and what what happens with that data in the long term so yeah you know we absolutely um the uh back to our theme of predicting the future or in this case probably predicting the present it turns out uh, that even though you were just spitballing in your tweet and your article and sort of fleshing out, here's how it could happen. Indeed, it is happening. Uh, NBC News uh, has a report out just this week uh, with multiple examples. Um, the example that's sort of the poster child of the story is Flickr. Um, it, once upon a time, the photo sharing site of choice online uh, after we were indexing the web for each other, <laughs> but yeah. not too, not too much, uh, too much longer, longer after. Yes. 
Um, and so uh, Flickr that you know be, uh, was purchased by Yahoo and became one of Yahoo's assets that it then tried to leverage. Um, it turned out that the thousands and thousands of photos, millions of photos, tens of millions of photos on Flickr that people had put there uh, may have been uh, starting to be used for purposes that the people who put them there uh, never anticipated, never thought about at the time. Oh, I'm sharing this, you know, photo of my friend that I took this day, and it turns out that a lot of the facial photos uh, were scooped up by IBM. And what I what I've concluded from the reporting here, NBC uh, reported on a couple of things. Uh, the Flickr data set appears to have been sold to IBM. Uh, and uh, there's a link in their story to um, a data set that's available from Yahoo Research uh, that uh, is 100 uh, million Creative Commons licensed images um, that are available for, for purchase. You can add this to your cart and then check out along with a whole bunch of other data sets that mm -hmm. Yahoo makes available. Um, so it appears that that's what IBM did here, uh, which is super fascinating when you drill down and you look at the, you know, buy this page for this data set. Uh, this list is compiled from data available on Yahoo's Flickr. All the photos and videos provided in the list are licensed under one of the Creative Commons copyright licenses. And as such, uh, they can be used to uh, they can be used for benchmarking purposes as long as the photographer videographer is credited for the original creation. Well, whoever wrote this for, for Yahoo, I'd love to have a conversation with them <laughs> uh, because they have just made some sweeping conclusions about the various Creative Commons licenses that were available uh, right. to be applied to your photos there. And what the heck is benchmarking purposes? Because right. you know a lot of people applied various licenses to their photos. One very critical license doesn't uh, it permit any commercial use at all. So if your benchmarking is for commercial purposes and uh, what you're doing is training in AI, which is what uh, IBM decided to do, uh, then you may be running afoul of that license. So we've got a whole bunch of issues uh, coming up here. Uh, before I finish sort of setting the table for this discussion, uh, NBC went on to report on various other um, AI training scenarios uh, taking place where the data was not done sort of in partnership with the site hosting the photos, as it was um, in the Yahoo case, but where the data is just flat out scraped from the web mm -hmm. um, so that no one is profiting from it, but the researchers and the research that they're doing. So just to complicate things a little bit further, uh, everything <laughs> I've said so far may make you have a straightforward um, tendency to think, well, these users, users' expectations were usurped and whether it's privacy law or copyright law, one way or another, they should have some kind of recourse against their data being used in this unexpected way. Um, well, back to what you do, Kate O'Neill, in putting <laughs> you know the humanist interests first and trying to always act in the human in the interest of humanity and making technology more friendly for humanity. What IBM was all about here is trying to improve its facial recognition AI to eliminate the biases that it that AI notoriously has um, against being able to identify people of uh, people accurately by their gender or their race. Um, there's a lot of documentation and research out there about how you know our current facial facial recognition technologies fall down on those fronts. So IBM's trying to be a good guy here, but they wound up ruffling a lot of users' feathers. And I'm wondering through your lens, Kate, um, how you would navigate that difficult situation. It is it is thorny. I mean, there it, certainly their intent is uh, is good. You know that the thought there is solid. 
Uh, but it's a little bit Robin Hood, isn't it? <laughs> it's like if we're going to <laughs> if we're going to achieve that outcome by uh, by taking data at by any means necessary, uh, and not necessarily conforming to the user expectations of how that data was going to be used, uh, or or subverting the the terminology or the expectations of the Creative Commons license. Uh, it's just there's a lot going on there that doesn't necessarily feel like it's in the best interests of of humanity. And I think you know one of the models that I've learned from uh, from my peers who work around social justice is that impact matters more than intent. And I think that's a really important framework to think about the. Um, the human experience of something like this. Sure, IBM may have intended to reduce the algorithmic bias of, of uh, facial recognition data sets. And I think that's a really important aim. And I think more companies need to be embarking on that. Uh, but the impact here is that the uh, the people who shared their their photos uh, on this platform with of different intent uh, years ago and you know, sort of maybe have forgotten that they even shared these photos to share with friends and family or something along those lines. Um, didn't necessarily expect for the, the, those photos to be used in this way, and may not appreciate that. Uh, for example, people of color uh, and people who are um, disproportionately targeted for uh, criminal uh, activity are going to be some of the people who are being trained, the, the facial recognition algorithms are being trained using their very photos in some cases uh, so that they may be able to be picked up erroneously in some cases uh, in, in criminal detection systems or, or law enforcement systems that uh, it's just all kinds of thorny that goes, that goes through every dimension of that issue. So mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, for, for me, I, I, I would appreciate, um, if I were consulting with IBM on the front end of this, I would have appreciated mm -hmm. their goal and and applauded their their intent. And I would have encouraged them to find another mechanism by which to seed this data, uh, to to find a training set, um, and create a training set that they could they could use to to improve the the recognition algorithms. You know, we even have now it's it's kind of a funny trend. I don't know if you've been seeing these um this person does not exist and this cat does not exist. These uh, generative ad adversarial networks that are creating uh, composite images of of people, but they're not really people. They're not people that have ever existed. They're just sort of sets of, of uh, characteristics that are blended together into what looks like a human face or a human form. Uh, I, I think we're just not, yeah, <laughs> you got one. Uh, wow. I just think, right, we're, we're not so- So, so are, are these- are these? Uh, what's the goal of this? Are they they f creating noise in the um, social networking user arena, they, or, or they could? I, I think yeah. they're, they're uh, you know you can think about a number of uses for uh, a, a tool like this. One of them could be at some point, you know, you could you could see a future where real people don't necessarily need to be sourced for stock photography. You don't necessarily need to pay models for for simple purposes where all you're trying to do is demonstrate, you know, someone uh, holding a thing or reacting to a thing or something like that. Uh, and and whether that's in the best interest of humanity, you know, that remains to be discussed and seen. Um, but I think for my purposes, what I, when I look at this, at the the difference between IBM, uh, and other companies scraping or buying sets of photos from a site like Flickr without necessarily gaining consent of the users, the real people who shared their real photos on that platform versus, mm -hmm. you know, on the other sort of almost extreme of, of this where you have uh, tools emerging like this person does not exist. I mean, I just think we're we're demonstrating that there is an awful lot of advancement going on in the space of human image recognition and projection. Uh, and, and it needs to be approached with the utmost concern for what it means for the identity of the person who's being scraped or, or used in some way that they didn't necessarily contribute to or, or, or consent to. I guess we're back to this must versus should uh, question 
with regard to making data sets available for research or other purposes um, and selling them, profiting off them, even if the much, much like the 10 year challenge issue you were mentioning before, even if the uh, photographs or the data, whatever it may be, are publicly available already. It's the aggregation and the packaging and the metadata that guarantees, okay, this is this person or, you know, whatever critical thing that the researcher or other person might need to know. Um, that um, putting that together is an order of magnitude different than what the expectations of the users may have been when they uploaded their photo to ultimately become part of that data set. And, and from the legal perspective, I can tell you that coming after Yahoo for what they did here in packaging all this is probably going to be really hard because their terms of service or flickers back in the day uh, had language that was broad enough to uh, be able to demonstrate that the users quote unquote consented to this, even though they never read or understood or gazed into their crystal, crystal ball sufficiently to know that this would ultimately happen to their data. There was broad but, language in the data policy or the terms of service that covers Yahoo's butt here. And um, I think we're talking about an issue? iterative changes too. I think we're talking about mm -hmm. changes that happened piece by piece because the uh, the acquisition of Flickr by Yahoo uh, introduced new terms to the the agreement, uh, and mm -hmm. then Yahoo tried a, a variety of approaches to uh, making that platform successful again once they had it. You know, creating the, the new professional levels and uh, you know really trying to skew to the photographer audience, um, the, the you know the professional photographer audience, and then at some point they had introduced new terminology, and I, I would have to go back and refresh my memory on what that terminology was, but a few years ago, I know that it was introduced recently enough that I removed all of my photos from Flickr. Uh, and I know that there, there was um, information going around uh, at the time that was suggesting, you know, you probably ought to get your photos off of Flickr if you still have them there. So mm -hmm. I think the, the complexity here is not just about, you know, a sort of uniform set of terms of services and a privacy policy and, a, and an expectation that was set once and sort of forgotten about. It was that approach at the beginning and then an iterative set of changes. And, you know, how do we kind of create this context where people know to keep themselves informed on the evolving terms of service and the evolving privacy policies that that accompany the services where their data is hosted and where they're sh sharing data or have shared data that remains as part of a legacy data set. So that's a tricky part of the equation too. And I don't pretend to have the answer there. I think we're going to be in a, in a, a struggle between a rush to move things forward as fast as possible and evolve technology as fast as possible. And a need to kind of keep it a little slower where we can make sure that we're considering the full repercussions of what happens uh, when that data kind of takes scale or meets scale. And that, right. that, that you know, to your point, I think that that may be the must and should uh, model in a different, in a different restating. Right. Um, you've been spending some time in the EU. You just recently spoke before the UN. Is that correct? Correct. the the uh, The UN was uh, was a real lifetime thrill. But that yeah, that was around technology and innovation and how it can affect humanity at scale. Uh, yeah, and have been speaking with cities around the world. Uh, and um, it's 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 really impressive to me how many different types of entities are really needing to think about data policies, data ethics, AI ethics, emerging technology uh, regulation. Uh, it, it's it's so far beyond just companies needing to think about their privacy policies and the, the regulatory approaches that they have or the sort of the approaches they take to governance of, of their own data and the data that they collect from their constituencies. But it's it's cities because more and more uh, smart city in infrastructure is coming online, and it's countries and it's uh, 
uh, museums and its entities that are not traditional companies. And it's uh, it's just an, a, a wide, wide variety of entities that are needing to think about these things. And I think it really behooves us as, as humans and as technologists who think about these kinds of things, which I assume most of this audience is, to really try to get deeper on, on where these uh, intersections are and what what we need to be concerned about as these things come to scale. What's your take on the GDPR's impact on thinking about all of this and how other governments are thinking about all of this? Well, I think it's it's a it's a great start, and and I think the um, the the example that it sets is going to is going to be very helpful for other companies following or the other countries, sorry, following suit. Um, I think the U.S. is inherently going to skew as it as it almost always does in um, in favor of favoring corporate entities and uh, and giving more loose protection to to humans. Uh, and I, I'm I'm excited to see how that plays out in different countries and how how different countries take on their interpretation of it. But I think that the U.S. Uh, I, I'm you know I'm an American and I'm I've always been and I appreciate capitalism. But I definitely think that you know our our tendency has always been to you know we we give personhood to companies and uh, we, it's a, it's an odd thing to live in a country where that's the the sort of default characterization of uh, the 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 struggle between who gets the the consideration in a, in a in terms of uh, rights and in terms of privacy and in terms of uh, uh, pro- property protection and so on so I, I'm very curious to see how it plays out in the US I, I'd very much like to be part of of shaping that discussion and I'm, I'm having the conversations here and there that that are part of that so that's that's encouraging. Um, I want to take your temperature on on your optimism versus pessimism, uh, gazing into the crystal ball and looking into the future. We've had a guest on the network before whose name is James Barrett. He wrote a mm-hmm. book called Our Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence and the End of the Human Era is the title of his book. Are you familiar with it? No, I'm not. Um, but it's so sort of his take, <laughs> yeah, as you can probably tell from the title, <laughs> it's very much a, a cautionary tale. Let's pump the brakes and think about things as we begin to build out artificially intelligent systems, because the small decisions we're making day by day now may put us in a place, you know, sort of like the climate change uh, metaphor that nobody wanted to put us on a path where uh, we can't control climate change, but it was all the little things that uh, right. went into it without too much thought. And then it was a juggernaut that you know we may not be able to rein in. And I think that's sort of his take on, on what AI might become. Mm-hmm. Um, and whereas you know, juxtapose that to your book, how you can make technology better for business and better for humans, uh, take some more, definitely more positive approach and uh, yeah, and doesn't does. you know wind up wiping us out at the hands of the monsters that we have birthed um do do you have second thoughts about that positive approach ever uh, how much do you think people should be uh pausing before um training further ai data sets to do all kinds of things yeah, I think the, the catch there is, so there's a couple of things. One is, uh, to your example of climate change, uh, one of the reasons why I think that um, that futurism is kind of a, a, a useless pursuit is that we are in charge of the future. We make decisions every day that change the future. So mm-hmm. every decision that we make somehow plays out into a future scenario. So I think it's important to feel that empowerment because otherwise we feel like it's hopeless or we feel like it's all just a foregone conclusion, like the climate change is inevitable and there's nothing we can do to right the course. And I think that's not the truth. The truth is that there are actions that we could take and they're all the way from the little actions to the massively big actions. But we need to have 
a sense of hope about it and a sense of positivity or else we're not going to to feel empowered to make those decisions and get those actions in place. And similarly with with AI, with automation, with all of these emerging technologies that bring uh, about new levels of capacity that have heretofore been unknown, uh, new levels of scale. Uh, we have the opportunity to be very intentional about how we use that capacity and how we how we what we bring to scale. Uh, and so I think it, the time is right right now for us to be having very honest heart to heart kind of examinations of what it is that we're trying to do inside of business and what we're trying to do inside of our cultures, inside of our uh, our uh, communities and civilization as a whole, and what characteristics about humanity we think are worth preserving and encoding and amplifying. And that's truly what it is that we do when we determine what what rules go into algorithms and what automation is going to to um, expedite for us and what AI is going to bring to scale in in new ways. So we are uh, we are encoding those decisions, and they they are, all about our values as much as they are about our biases. So it's all about at the moment, you know, having having these very self-reflective kinds of discussions where we can understand what these biases are and that the the time couldn't be more perfect for the reckoning that we're doing socially with uh, gender constructs and race constructs. And, and all of those things feel, I think, to some people like a very divisive kind of, of time in our culture, but it's it's an important time. It's an important process, I think, for us to be going through because we need to get to our most evolved understandings of humanity. We need to get to our most egalitarian understandings so that we can make the right types of decisions and encode those into algorithms and encode those into AI. Machines are what we encode of ourselves. And I think it's truly important that we make the right kinds of encodings, that we get the right decisions encoded. When we do that, if we do that, we will be bringing the best of ourselves to scale. And so that is where the the basis of my optimism comes from. I don't necessarily think that it's a foregone conclusion that we will make the right choices, uh, but I think that it is entirely possible that we can, and it, it's imperative that we discuss it and that we uh, we encourage each other to do that, that we create the framework for having a productive and meaningful type of environment where we can bring the best of humanity to scale. Yeah, I, I like that vision and and I like the analogies you've already given in the show today where, uh, you know, we could still be hand indexing the web if the automation hadn't been created to uh, make searching it more efficient and pleasant for everyone involved. And we may well need AI and algorithms to solve the climate change problem. Um, because right, it may exactly. not be solvable in, in any other way. Um, bearing those kinds of things in mind, are there specific um, ethical guidelines, suggestions that you um, discuss with companies that you consult with uh, specifically in the arena of AI? So it comes back to to human data. And so mm -hmm. remembering that I, I always like to say analytics are people, you know, the, the data that we collect in business, uh, digital transformation, for example, is fundamentally about data transformation. It's about the connectedness of systems of data within a company, being able to be transparent and connected with other systems of data and being able to make more efficient and uh, more scalable recommendations and decisions within those systems. But by and large, that data is human data. So to contextualize that first and foremost as human data and understand that the decisions that we're making with that data to accelerate business, to amplify the objectives of the business have to be in line with human objectives. We have to understand what it is that people are trying to accomplish that brings them to an intersection with the business. What, what it is that, that people are going about their world, their, their lives uh, doing that has them have a touch point with the business at the moment where they can become a customer or become a user. Uh, and so having that context, that, that human-centric approach to digital transformation, I think is, is critical. 
And then that leads itself to the discussion of AI, to automation. Once you understand what it is that the company exists to do and what people exist to do or, or are trying to do outside of the company and they interact with your company, once you can really understand that and contextualize it, then I believe that you can start to build a business model around it, a data model around it, and, and begin to accelerate it and begin to amplify it. But you won't amplify anything meaningful if you begin to a apply technology against it before you get to that point. So just the ethical stand, the ethical framework is contextualize this as a human problem and make sure that you understand that really dimensionally and what experiences you're trying to create before you ever get to trying to create a data model around it and before you ever get to the decision of what technology to deploy against it to accelerate and amplify it. And naturally it leads to issues of automation and AI. Those, those technologies, those sets of technologies are going to bring about new levels of scale and capacity that are exciting and, and uh, certainly will bring new opportunities for business. But I think they they cannot be the the leader of the decision. They they just won't fit with strategy if they do. Uh, so just from a purely strategic standpoint, you know we we can't have a technology led digital transformation. It has to be a human led digital transformation. Gosh, I hope so. Um, so that's <laughs> the strategic approach you give to uh, the private sector. Do you take mm -hmm. a different approach when you're talking to governments and lawmakers? Yeah, well, sort of. I think you can still take a human-centric approach there too. And when I spoke to uh, the city of Amsterdam, for example, uh, I presented to them a, uh, a framework for the human-centered metropolis of the future. And the idea there is still, uh, you know, you're still thinking about what a human who interacts in the city or in the metropolis is is trying to go about their day doing and what what their needs are and and how they intersect with the city. Uh, what makes the city successful? What makes the human successful? And then you find all of these opportunities to use the built environment and use signals around the built environment to uh, bring data through that process and be able to to um, streamline those experiences for people and help them have more fulfilling and more meaningful experiences within the city. And I think you really, as soon as you take that to the a more macro level to a country, uh, you you can have that same type of, of conversation. Uh, it changes, I think, when you start beginning to um, to lay down regulatory restrictions. Uh, the moment you start trying to, like like your, your framework of must versus should, if we want mm -hmm. to really define the musts, uh, then we're talking about a, a, a sort of different approach to the framework. And that's going to be much more about uh, uh, under no circumstances should it be this, uh, and the, that might be just the the uh, over collection of certain types of data. I love, uh, for example, I come back to um, the the one instance uh, that that has always stuck with me as as an overreach, which is Uber collecting uh, battery level information in the the full set of data that it collects from a, a, a ride hail. So the moment when you are are out there trying to hail a ride via Uber, uh, the information that that is being transmitted to Uber includes your battery level. And they, uh, at one point a few years ago, had admitted that they tested, not in necessarily real world use, but they had begun to test whether they could actually surcharge based on low battery levels. And uh, they found that they could. They found that, you know, of course, a human in a situation where their battery level is low and they're waiting for a ride to pick them up and take them home or wherever is going to feel some level of desperation and then going to be uh, unnaturally incented to take an, an additional fare and to to um, to be overcharged for the service that they would otherwise have been charged less for. So that's a very unethical use of that data. And they have sworn up and down that they have not deployed that into production. But I think you're toying with yourself. If you collect that data and, and figure out how to manipulate people, uh, and, and now you just have to kind of exercise so much restraint not to let a profit motive overtake the ethical, you know, sort of must versus should framework there. Uh, and, and and not let yourself be overcome by trying to make the quick buck and charge a surcharge to people uh, where where they have a low battery level. So I think if you if you just set up a framework where you're collecting the data that truly serves 
the objectives that align between your business and the human objectives. Then you're setting yourself up for not having an, an excess of data that cannot serve you and cannot serve the humans in an aligned way. Uh, and and you don't leave yourself more vulnerable to that data being breached or leaked as well. So it's a it's a risk reduction as well. I think there's there's any number of of angles to take on on the issues that that concern data use and and guidance. It just comes down to taking the the human approach aligned with the the entity's approach and how can we make sure that they align and they're we're we're coming to the best outcome. So that in the case of private business, if you have those objectives aligned, then as the business scales and succeeds, it brings human uh, stakeholders right along with them. So you want we want to see that. We want to see, you know, both sides achieve success, of course. We definitely do. I, I, I'm going to ask you a really cynical question right now. <laughs> uh, and and that is, do you ever, ever feel as though sometimes uh, you're dealing, you're having conversations with the private sector and maybe you've been hired by the private sector um, to give them all this good advice and that maybe that relationship is window dressing uh, or could be. Uh, in Could other be. words, the company the company gets to say, "Hey, we hired Kate O'Neill, so we're thinking about the right things and doing the right things." And then they go on and do something that's maybe not so human centered, and Kate O'Neill just has to throw up her hands and go, "Well, I tried." It could be, and it's it's a um, it's an ethical quandary, I suppose, for me uh, whether I want to be part of those discussions. Uh, but I I don't find that in many of the cases where I have interacted with. Uh, company's leadership that they don't seem genuine and they they don't seem to be um, truly trying to figure out how to do what's best for the company and not screw over humans in the process. That that mm -hmm. really does feel like it's a it's a uniformly consistent type of of need and of desire of, uh, on the behalf of of leaders. Uh, it's it's astonishing to me, really. I think I think people do tend to have a cynical view about company leadership and government leadership and and what what has been more true that I have found in in my work with leaders is that they are often really struggling to understand how they can do better how they can lead their company better how they can lead their their city better or their institution better uh, and and I just don't think that we have given them the tools. I don't think that they learn these kinds of things in business school and they haven't been leading the company in such a way that it's been human centric aligned with, you know, sort of technological progress. What we, the tools that we have given leaders is make profit and profit is a very short sighted way of running a company. It's a, it's a directional indicator. It is nothing more. It is one dimension of success. Uh, we don't we don't encourage people to lead companies in a multi-dimensional way that gives them a really clear sense that they're bringing about something meaningful and useful into the world. But everybody wants to, almost everybody. I mean, there, it's it's rare to find a leader who uh, truly would would not want to be leading a meaningful company in some some fashion. Uh, so I think. I think it's just a question of giving the right tools and the right frameworks and making it a little easier for for leaders to do the right thing. Uh, and certainly, there may be examples of of company leadership that that will never do the right thing. And I, I hope that they don't hire me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not too. Um, and I guess the the flip side of that question is is not quite so cynical, but but follows on from what you're saying about having the tools and the background to really understand the issues that you're grappling with. Um, one of my takes, and and I'm, it's not my unique take on on the lawmakers of our world just generalizing in a sweeping way, is they really could could learn a lot about um, what technology does, what it might do. And you know their learning curve there, partially uh, because of the age of people who wind up, you know, being in that situation mm -hmm. and their familiarity with the tools they use on a daily basis, and partially because they've got lots of issues to consider, and sure. tech policy is only one of them, mm -hmm. uh, and it might not be the one that they particularly have drilled down on. But it's hard to make laws about things that you don't thoroughly understand, and and I wonder. Um, it, how you try and aid that situation? Yeah, you know, I, I liked uh, the the interview between 
Anand Giridharadas and Elizabeth Warren that uh, that took place at South by Southwest. Uh, he asked her about um, making laws uh, and and having more knowledge. Like, can, can you make laws about things that you don't understand? Or I don't rem- remember exactly how he worded the question, but she gave what I thought was a really good answer in the sense that she always wanted more data. She always wanted to be able to uh, to contextualize the data, and and her examples consistently talked about getting down to real people and how how these things affected real people. And of course, that resonates with me. I want I want the laws to uh, to be thought of in a framework that actually looks at the impact on real people. How can a law that protects uh, human data be meaningful unless it actually looks at how it will play out? with real human scenarios. And so I think it's gonna take uh, some collaborations, constituencies between um, researchers and uh, thought leaders and and politicians and uh, corporate leaders and a number of, of different types of, of, uh, of partners to really get something that actually approaches a meaningful construct that can can be that can withstand, uh, the the vagaries of how it will be applied across different types of examples, and that will withstand a little bit the test of time, because I mean obviously these things can change, but it takes so long to craft them in the first place. It takes so long to change them, and takes you know sort of bipartisan uh, agreement to change them, that it might as well be as close to right in the first place as we can make it. And I don't think it's going to be that unless you have a lot of different perspectives represented who all bring a different sort of view of of human experience to the table. So a couple of uh, things ripped from the headlines I think we should hit on before we close out the show today. Um, just yesterday, and you know the story is still unfolding, there was this terrible shooting at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, As of this morning, I saw the death count was already at 49. God uh, knows it could grow from there, let's hope not. Uh, But just terrible, terrible events unfolding. And the the technology tie in there is uh, apparently the shooter was live streaming as Mm -hmm. it was happening. And that those uh, streams were available for some fairly significant amount of time uh, on CNN this morning. I saw they were saying like possibly 15 minutes uh, before they were pulled down and taken off the site. And and I wonder from your perspective, how you grapple with that issue of making a useful and beneficial in many ways or in many applications anyway, tool um, available, widely available for free uh, for use by anyone who knows how to live stream um, and and preventing the live streaming of terrible events, which may well have factored into the shooter's decision to actually do it. Oh, well, if I can make this a global uh, spectacle by using this tool, then it's even more worthwhile for me to pursue my hateful agenda. Um, how do How do you think companies can and should grapple with that. Obviously, they're not at the point where they can immediately identify what's happening and make Mm. sure that something like that doesn't get streamed. I think in many cases, it's probably an upstream decision, an upstream of that event. Uh, So we we do know that this alleged shooter is uh, someone who spent a lot of time online in various communities. Uh, it's entirely possible that there were patterns of behavior that could have led to uh, identification that he was uh, likely to behave in an an untoward way. I mean, that's a very, very understated thing. But I think there there have got to be uh, behavior patterns. There have got to be recognizable types of activities. And certainly I wouldn't want companies to be uh, proactively sort of um, legislating or banning people for, in a sense, thought crimes. But I think we can we can see, we'll, we'll be able to go back through his history. And there are plenty of other examples out there of people who have uh, committed heinous crimes and have online histories that we could we could learn from. Uh, Kevin Roos wrote, wrote a fantastic piece in the New York Times uh, just this morning about how this was a mass murder 
of and for the internet. And it, it really does do a, a great job of reflecting on uh, the, the sort of cultural implications of, of the various sort of sub subcultures and subgroups of the internet that this person felt part of and that sort of uh, where the type of activity flourishes that that isn't necessarily a mass shooting in in action but it isn't productive and it 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 can be associated with hate speech in many cases it can be associated with countercultural activity and and I I think we we just need a much more rigorous much more robust understanding of what that type of, of hate speech and and um, troublesome kind of content is and have algorithms be much more sophisticated and human moderators be much more sophisticated in being able to to monitor it. That's not a comprehensive recommendation. I don't have a comprehensive recommendation. I think we're all still learning how how we're going to deal with this going forward. But it isn't our first example of uh, a heinous act committed uh, for the sake of internet attention or any kind of attention. And it isn't the first example of someone who had a, a following online and a, a presence online that probably had some troublesome, uh, some characteristics to it. So I think we, we just have a lot of unpacking to do and some learning to do about how to how to be more uh, upstream of what what happened yesterday and, and make decisions uh, sooner and be monitoring sooner. Right, so, so perhaps maybe not you know, a thought crime ban situation, but but maybe something shy of that in closer monitoring or um, depriving of privileges or making privileges more conditional based on other activity. are I just you know sort that of it's, headed? it's yeah, it's rare that I think we see this type of of thing where we we've seen people do, um, you know, a a person shoot a domestic partner, for example, and then been able to go back and see the history of hateful messages that most likely he and we we see this pattern of of it being male abusers who domestically abuse women and shoot them. Uh, that's one framework or one archetype, and there are often histories of of um, you know sort of participation in groups that are uh, are sort of posting content that is not uh, healthy, productive discussion, and I, it, there's just there's patterns I think that that emerge, and. Th- Scholars are out there studying this type of, of framework. This is this is a departure from from my expertise, but I do I do recognize that again and again in digital culture we have seen these real acts committed uh, of of terror or of of violence that can then back be back, traced back through the person's history that they have been participating in hateful speech or other types of, of um, activity online that would indicate a pattern. And I, I don't think that surveillance of, of people is necessarily what I'm calling for. I don't think that I'm saying that there should be a uh, proactive, like I said, no thought crime proactive banning or anything like that. But I, but there's, there's gotta be a way intelligently to, to, suss this type of thing out. There are patterns that must exist. We have enough examples now, unfortunately, of violence being committed uh, by people who have these types of patterns. So we need to put it together and we need and companies need to to listen to the experts who are making these recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other uh, sort of current event type thing I wanted to bring up with you uh, is, of course, California is one of the states that has a privacy law that looks closest to the GDPR in right. the United States. And recently, our governor, Gavin Newsom, in his State of the State address, mentioned something else. And here I'll quote him. He says, California is proud to be home to technology companies determined to change the world. But companies that make billions of dollars collecting, curating, and monetizing our personal data have a duty to protect it. Consumers have a right to know and control how their data is being used. I applaud this legislature for passing the first in the nation digital privacy law last year. 
but California's consumers should also be able to share in the wealth that is created from their data. And so I've asked my team to develop a proposal for a new data dividend for Californians because we recognize that your data has value and it belongs to you. So that's as specific as he got, but he floated this notion of a data dividend that implies some sort of um, compensation, I would say, for uh, use of data in exchange for free services. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about that. I've always had a problem with the idea of data as currency and uh, any kind of attempt to codify that into a model where uh, where human data has some financial value attached to it that the humans can collect on. I have yet to see a model that makes me confident that that won't be abused, that that won't fall victim to the existing uh, systemic marginalization that uh, that exists within society, that that um, the, the, the privileged few uh, get to exercise decisions that the less privileged many don't get to exercise. Uh, I just I just have not seen evidence yet that there could be a model that doesn't fall victim to to perpetuating and prolonging those circumstances. So I think there's there's got to be a way that uh, that humans have transparency over the data we share and propagate online and that we have control and consent and can grant consent to its use and that we have uh, benefits from that uh, and that there's value attached to that. But value need not necessarily be financial value in as overt or crisp a form as as what it seems that Gavin Newsom is alluding to there or that other mm -hmm. people have alluded to like Will I am and a, a few others who have floated similar types of ideas um, I think that we we are in a place and time where we need to begin to construct new ideas of value as well we're we're going to be quickly coming to a time where human jobs are going to be disrupted and uh, and augmented through automation and AI so um, the the existing form of compensation and, and value in a, a strictly financial sense is going to have to be upended in some way or reinvented or disrupted or or innovated upon in some in some form or fashion. I don't necessarily think that it behooves us to carry forward this sort of limited notion that the only way to provide value around human data is to attach a monetary amount to it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, do you think that there's, have we gotten to the point where some of these services, i.e. the ability to live stream using a free tool, uh, that that has risen to the level of some kind of public utility or some sort of fundamental right that people should have, even though they're being offered by private companies who are profiting off their data in order to make these things available? I don't know. I don't have a, a firm take on on the the idea of regulating something like Twitter, for example, as a utility. I, it it doesn't strike me as the right approach, but I, I I'm open to being swayed one way or the other. I, I think there's there's other approaches that that must be out there. When I think about the proposals to break up companies like Facebook, Google, and and Amazon, for example, uh, there that doesn't strike me as necessarily a bad idea. It doesn't necessarily strike me as the only idea. And and I don't I don't know what the right answer is. And it, just as with this the utilities idea, it feels like we've yet to begun really exploring the fullness of of what um, how we can model what a sort of the new world looks like with these there there are going to be companies that gain size and scale very very quickly as a result of their technological advantages and there are going to be disproportionate effects that they have on humanity uh, that we know and breaking up these particular few companies right now won't necessarily change the fact that other companies will become large and will have dispropor disproportionate power. So we would need to create a template if we do this type of, of breaking up approach, for example, that we would need to create a template that says it's either once a company reaches a certain size or once it reaches a certain level of disproportionate impact or whatever it is, 
But is breaking up the only way that we accomplish that? I'm I'm not sure. There there's probably a, a number of approaches that we could discuss that are that are both human friendly and business friendly that can get us to a place where we can advance our future in in an exciting way for all of us that don't necessarily feel like they're arbitrary and and are only going to affect these instances right now and not save us in the future. And have, we'll have to have this conversation again and again about utilities and about breaking up companies and so on. Okay, one final question before we wrap up what has been a really fascinating interview, Kate. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, my uh, my final question is, is back to your um, tenure challenge tweet. Uh, you were discerning there that there is information that people are sharing without realizing the impact of what they are sharing. And I wonder if you know you can you have any other examples that cause you concern on behalf of humanity at large that people should be aware of and think twice about. I think it's a it's a very faceted uh, multi-dimensional kind of thing. I, I think I've always thought or for years have thought about the the data that we share online as being, our sort of true aspirational selves, the the way we project ourselves online, and and I think this has become something that's been recognized as the, sort of the Instagram phenomenon, where uh, people are sharing only the curated highlight reel of their lives and not the 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 real highs and lows. Um, but that I think is be- because of the nature of this phenomenon that I believe what we tend to share tends to be what we wish were true, and uh, that we we become the version or we we project the aspirational version of who we are. Uh, if that's the case, then I think there's the that ties directly to what I, I've identified as we have, you know, we talk about the fear of missing out and the joy of missing out. But there's also I've talked about the fear of not sharing. And that is because I think we actually get a satisfaction. We actually get a sense of a, a, a deepening of the experience by sharing it. Uh, any experience that we have, whether it's eating a meal or attending a concert or whatever, uh, whenever we're um, being made fun of by our friends for taking a photo or taking video of that experience, it's because we actually are connecting with that experience in the moment by uh, by framing it, by deciding what we're curating and what means something to us. So when we, I think when we take that idea forward into looking at things like the tenure challenge and Cambridge Analytica's game where they sussed out all these uh, sort of facets of personality, we we have an awful lot that we're saying about ourselves. And these things are things that we should feel uh, proud of, but protective of. Uh, we should absolutely be choosing, you know, who it is that is our audience for these, these uh, things that we share about ourselves and uh, deciding for whom is that meaningful and to whom is it meaningful for me to communicate that. So there's, I think, a more uh, an evolution of our current state of social media sharing that will bring us to uh, maybe sort of full circle back to a, a more permissioned view of of sharing, uh, where we may be able to select our audiences a little more carefully. We may be able to determine, you know, for whom is this a relevant share. Uh, that kind of a framework would I think would be a meaningful add to the the space. But I think in general, we need to be become, as users, more sophisticated and more thoughtful about why we're sharing and what we gain from that and what other people gain from those shares. And the more we do that, the more we stand to recognize patterns and recognize opportunities like these memes and games that ask us to participate in very structured, specific ways as not necessarily being in our best interest, but in someone else's best interest, someone who's looking for us to share specific information. If we want to share information about ourselves, by all means, we should do that, but we should do it in a meaningful way that's about our fulfillment and the fulfillment of the people that we're interacting with, not about the fulfillment of a third party that's collecting our data for reasons we don't even know. (laughs) So the more sophisticated we can be about that, I think the better off we'll be. Yes, words to live by. Kate O'Neill, such a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us here on Triangulation today. Thank you so much for having me. What a fun time. Kate's book is Tech Humanist, How You Can Make Technology Better for Business and for Better for Humans. Kate, before we let you go, uh, I know you do a lot of 
speaking in a public venue that people might want to seek you out and attend in the future? Is there anything on deck that you want to let people know about? Oh, I got a lot coming up this year. I am not sure what has been announced <laughs> yet. So uh, <laughs> that one coming up in April, uh, if anybody is in the vicinity of Vancouver, uh, there's an event called Epic Vancouver. And I think you can find information at theepiccommunity.com. Uh, and it's going to be about, I think it's 14 speakers and uh, really about a small audience. I think only 100 people, so they may not have very many tickets left, but a wonderful example of bringing together a lot of different topics to help people become a, a better version of themselves. So there's there's that, there's a, a lot of UX and uh, and design conferences coming up this year and a lot of work around uh, cities and, and governance. So I think it's gonna be a really exciting year. Please just, uh, uh, I'd love if you're interested for you to just follow along on Cato on Twitter, and you'll see plenty of me talking about where I'm gonna be speaking and, and what's coming up next. That's wonderful. And also people can keep up with you at your website, koinsights.com, uh, where you blog and have uh, lots of great information related to what we've been discussing here today. That's right, thank you. Kate, thanks again so much. And uh, we hope to have you back on the network at some time in the future. Um, you're certainly a fascinating person to talk to. And we wish you all the best with your quest to keep tech companies and governments fo focused on the humanist aspect of going forward technology. Appreciate your support. Thank you, Denise. Thank you everyone for joining us today on this episode of Triangulation. We'll be back again next week. Until then, take care.